Our first uh, talk is on Tosis Revisited Controversies and Advances. I think there is no point playing the videos. <laughs> so Tosis as <coughs> excuse me. Tosis as you all know is drooping of the upper eyelid and the challenges begin first and foremost with our knowledge which we should update before we proceed with the management of a patient of ptosis so knowing about pseudo ptosis is equally important like in this case the eye which is appearing totic is not a true ptosis it is a thysis bulbi with cataract and iridocyclitis then we need to know about other causes of pseudo ptosis like anophthalmic socket thysic eye orbital floor fractures leading to anophthalmos can lead to a pseudo ptosis lid retraction of the other eye a very common feature with our residents they will the first years will they will come rushing ma'am he has ptosis in the other eye without realizing that the other eye uh, is having lid retraction which is giving the appearance of ptosis then mechanical uh, pseudo ptosis can be there due to these dermoids clazion and cellulitis and treatment of pseudo ptosis is basically the treatment of the cause which we should look after now coming to the congenital ptosis it is basically a muscular dystrophy with the amount of droopiness is uh, in ratio with the amount of loss of striated muscle fibers and autosomal dominant in condition unilateral is more common than bilateral but some, and some studies say it is of the ratio of 3 is to 1 then uh, it can be further classified as simple congenital ptosis with superior rectus weakness with uh, bps with markers gun jaw winking and the third nerve ptosis and it is definitely a challenging management issue and a thorough examination of a case of ptosis is a must and why it is must to decide the surgical procedure of choice and to avoid any post operative surprise and our challenges begin when as uh, uh, young the child is evaluation of a pre verbal child in the presence of anxious parents is one of the biggest challenge and we need to determine the etiology mainly to determine it is a congenital or it is due to any other cause so we know about the history factors the age dinal variation jaw movement history of trauma everything has to be taken care considering how the eyelid position affects the child's visual and psychosocial development is very important because that will decide the time of our surgery its special consideration needs to be given to the risk of amblyopia if the pupillary area is being covered and we are in doubt that amblyopia is going to set in we should think of uh, other ways or go for an early surgery if uh, crutch glasses are not easy for the patient and if it is a non amblyogenic we can carry on for some time till the lps is well developed and the child can get operated even at teenage and provided he is not having any cosmetic issues too much so like in this case in the, how we proceed with the case of ptosis we start first start with the inspe inspection of the lid crease lid lag just ask the patient to look in down gaze the pupillary aperture will increase in cases of congenital measurement of the vertical palpebral height and then measurement of the lid fold that is done in the primary gaze and then the uh, lid crease is done in down gaze very important because that will be the site of our measure uh, giving the incision mrd1 and mrd2 in both the eyes MRD MRD1 is more important than VPH that we know if there is discrepancy between the two we follow the MRD1. Burke's method followed for the LPS the, uh, uh, measurement of the LPS action very important landmark for deciding our ptosis uh, surgery. Bell's phenomena very important to see because otherwise if it is poor we need to undercorrect. Marker's gun another important thing and corneal sensation. So all these things have to be seen. Every time we anal uh, analyze a case of ptosis, remember this mnemonic and it will be helpful. Uh, drooping of the lid, excursion, superior rectus, tear film evaluation, ellipse test is generally done in infants when we uh, uh, evert the lid and the in, uh, frequent, uh, I mean the uh, quickness with which it reverts back, it tells about the strength uh, of the LPS muscle. The neurological examination and yawning for the marker's gun. This we tell our residents to be ready with a standard format. In every ptosis workup, we have to follow all these steps, should be followed. Now, preoperatively, as I said, operative conditions can be just see whether the eye is getting in, going into amblyopia, if it is responsible for a chin up position. Many patients of bilateral ptosis, the parent will come that the child keeps the chin up, which is very disturbing and these should this it should also be considered as one of the cause of going for early surgery and how it affects the social interaction of the child. If the child is feeling complex or he is not comfortable in his peer group, that is another one reason for going for an early surgery. In case Case, there are uh, we can uh, have a waiting period due to any reason then crutch glasses for amblyogenic eyes are very important we should emphasize on them so that the eye doesn't go into amblyopia 
and if the compliance with crutch glasses is not poor patient has to be kept on good follow up and if the compliance is very poor or not followed we should go for early surgery interaction with patient is very important because ideal results cannot be obtained in every patient we should not raise the expectations of the patient too high because it is very troubling later on both for the patient as well as the surgeon and inform the patient that there can be a chance of resurgery also again the uh, severity of ptosis the levator action and whether it is simple or a complicated are the features which we have to keep in mind always quantify and classify the ptosis in two different settings always measure the lps also in two different settings so you are confirmed about that which procedure you have to decide again there are various things how much effort the child exudes to utilize the involved eye the frontalis action you should be careful in those who have a good frontalis action slings will also give a good result uh, so this has to be also taken care of wells phenomena as i said if wells phenomena is poor chances of exposure keratitis are marked so in such cases slight under correction and sometimes we avoid surgery if wells phenomena is absent because it is better to leave the patient a little co cosmetically disturbed rather than giving him a functional problem of corneal ulcers and due to exposure carrot that is even more painful so you have to balance your decision strength of the eyelid crease again tells us about the lps action so choice of surgical procedure will deter uh, determining an appropriate procedure should be individualized and obtaining ideal surgical outcomes can be both challenging and controversial this can vary from surgeon to surgeon so good levator function we would go for a fasinella fas cervate or an lps resection or lps plication uh it is a favored procedure for children in mild degree of ptosis who have minimal response with uh, uh, phenylephrine the ratio of tarsectomy to eyelid elevation is 2 mm of tarsectomy with 1 mm of desired elevation when we want so we just evert the lid pass three sutures at the uh, everted end of the lid three more sutures are passed at the fornix coming out from the lid margin these are very helpful bitheria et al had recommended this and now this is being followed almost ev every time because it makes the surgery quite easy so we measure 2 mm of the tarso conjunctivo molar area and that uh, it is marked it is cut uh, followed by the suturing which is started so after cutting it we will start with the conjunctival suturing first and uh, completing the suturing the uh, um, suture is exteriorized and we can get good results with this uh, 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 does little these are the few patients of uh, i've done with uh, mild help uh, ptosis which we corrected with fasinella cervix surgery coming to fair good uh, to good levator function levator resection uh, cutting in the salient features of this is that cutting of the lps ons is very important we should be careful about the vitnals ligament medially we should take care of the superior oblique tendon and laterally the lacrimal gland suture placement is important we should avoid passing suture through the orbital septum and create a good eyelid crease by taking appropriate bites from the lps so after giving a lid crease incision uh, and exposing the tarsal plate we go behind and uh, try to uh, we have to see that orbital septum is cut we uh, uh, amount of ptosis the resection that has to be done is marked and after this it is again reinserted at the tarsal plate so in a after good after doing a number of surgeries you become quite experienced and you can give good results not that difficult a surgery i would say Come, going to the next is the lps ply, elevator plication uh, it is a simple safe effective and versatile procedure for correction again of mild moderate blepharoptosis advantages are it is less time consuming no muscle is excised earlier revision if needed can be done and it is simple to learn for beginners however disadvantages are that it has a greater chance of drooping from the fourth week onwards and it fail to correct dystrophic muscle in congenital ptosis though it is a good procedure but still i think i prefer lps resection and i have seen majority preferring that although i have done a number of cases but if given a choice i prefer a lps resection maybe my results are better with that now most important this controversy which always comes is for the poor levator function whether we should go for a supra maximal levator resection or a transfrontalis sling now uh, there are various options available if it is a unilateral ptosis with poor levator function the unilateral sling bilateral sling can be done which used to be done previously nowadays i don't think anybody does bilateral sling patients are not willing also for the uh, touching the normal eye supra maximal levator resection is a very good option uh, so i personally prefer if the ptosis uh, uh, lps action is between 4 to 5 even 4.5 i have tried and even with 4 supra maximal levator is 
section gives good result it definitely is a little tedious process takes more time you have to put in a few extra steps of uh, putting a phonic suture also the uh, resection of a strip of skin has to be done and all these procedures if you take care of it gives good result especially in young children giving a good lid crease is very satisfying for the patient than going for sling where we know that we cannot give a good lid crease and a, a large amount of lid lag may be present so supra maximal and then always there is an option we can always tell the patient that if the supra maximal is not uh, gives good results sling can be done later on also after 3 to 6 months but giving a trial but uh, 4 4.55 i have always tried and it has been satisfactory for me these are few cases of severe ptosis in which i have tried supra maximal levator resection initially i did have few complication of con conjunctival prolapse but now with experience and learning the extra things that need to be done i am quite comfortable with it and i prefer it as my procedure of choice sling surgery uh, we have to decide between fox pentagon and the crawford this i am telling you the challenges and the controversies which we face otherwise sling surgery everybody knows uh, uh, so for the fox triangle is the lower one which you see we give two triangles and the upper one is pentagon over the years pentagon used to be the preferred choice but of lately fox uh, crawford this fox uh, this crawford double triangle is also being accepted because it gives a good uh, uh, contour to the lid there's a balanced contour of the lid both side which fox went again sometimes is not able to give so it depends on surgeon to surgeon again what you prefer i personally prefer the crawford tri double triangle now over the years i have found it because with fox sometimes there is clumping of the tissue over the forehead then again one incision is uh, with fox crawford you can just end up over here and under lie over there with fox uh, pentagon you have another scar over here so that is one advantage also however uh, the this autogenous tensor tendon fascia lata is still the gold standard wherever it can be preferred but still i think maximum of us because of the tedious procedure that it has to follow and in pediatric age group because the uh, ex taking out this uh, tendon is also not easy so this oro sling which is the preferred material uh, silicon is the one which is being preferred so transfrontalis sling if it is done being done in, in a adult and it is done under la on the table itself you can uh, monitor your result you can after passing the sling i have tried making the patient sit and uh, comparing with the other eye and then tying down it has given satisfactory result so you can try this also so i i think we are not left with these um, uh, markers gun jaw winking to eliminate the jaw winking levator excision has to be done and for to correct the ptosis the facial lata sling is the preferred but in this also we are doing the silicon sling where various options were previously also available but preferred now is unilateral levator excision with unilateral sling with most of us are which i think are doing so it gives good result once you do a levator excision with uh unilateral bps if we know it is has these all uh, things epicanthus inversus telecanthus ptosis decrease the horizontal palpebral aperture ectropion flattened supra orbital ridge now i won't say it's a controversy but debate that whether it should be done in two steps or it should be done in one step many people uh, prefer to doing both the things the horizontal increase the cu plasty or the uh, and the lateral cantholysis followed by the sling surgery and the uh, uh, they prefer to do it in the same sitting however personally i do it in two sittings first the you know doing the this uh, medial plasty and the lateral in one sitting followed 3 months later by the sling surgery and uh, i have been able to get good results this was a patient of blepharophimosis which we operated in two stages and we got reasonably good results i have other patients also anyway so this i'll skip complications under correction uh, very common so generally corrected within a week or two immediately after surgery you have to take care with an augmented lps resection it can require repeat surgery over correction again with traction it generally comes down or with massage so immediate post op period has to be rigorous follow up you should follow up the patient especially if you think there is some over or under on regular intervals even if you want you can keep the patient admitted and see that you can give him good result then contour abnormalities lag of thelma is very common in the initial period that is normal it uh, generally with time it covers up conjunctival prolapse as i told in uh, supra maximal resection it is common but uh, after 
passing phonic sutures, the incidence of that also decreases. Exposure keratitis, if you have not been careful in the post-op period or the Bell's phenomena is poor. In sling surgery, granuloma formation can be there at the scar site. So you have to be careful. So my take-home message is that careful pre-operative evaluation is the first and foremost thing. Planning and counseling comes second. Usually results in satisfactory surgical results with happy parents and happy patients can be there. Families should be aware that child needs long-term follow-up for visual development, ocular health and possibility of revision surgery. So congenital ptosis surgery in spite of all its challenges is extremely gratifying. This was a teenage girl who I corrected and she went, she got married and from her honeymoon she sent me this pic that ma'am <laughs> I have corrected the ptosis. So thank you all. With this I complete the talk. Next, I would invite Dr. Shalu Bageja. Ma'am is going to speak on lid reconstruction. <coughs> Good morning, everyone. So we all know eyes are the center of the face and any asymmetry or... Uh, abnormality uh, between the two eyes is uh, quite evident and of concern to the patient and so thus uh, needs to be reconstructed. Uh, these eyelid defects uh, can be congenital due to coloboma or traumatic due to uh, trauma or tumor excision. The goal of reconstruction we know is to restore the physiological functioning and the anatomic integrity and to provide the best cosmesis to the patient. Uh, for all this, uh, we have to have a well uh, verse with the knowledge of the anatomy of the eyelid and its uh, soft tissue as well as the bony landmarks so that we can uh, provide them the good cosmesis. The basic principles uh, lines in replacing the like with the like tissue. So all the lamella should be repaired. At least one lamella should have an intact vascular supply. So whenever we have this patient, we have to plan them properly, do the careful evaluation, do the documentation with photographs and diagrams, and discuss with patients, as, as already stressed by Dr. Urmil, that uh, we have to know what they expect and what we can deliver, so the proper counseling needs to be done. Coming to the evaluation, it's important that we note down what, where is the defect, is the medial lateral central, is involving the canthus, what is the size of the defect, it is involving only the anterior lamella or the posterior lamella. It's a full thickness defect or in margins are involved or not. Uh, it's important to note the laxity of the lids for the, according to the age. The skin may be lax, which can be used for the anterior lamella reconstruction. What is the condition of the opposite eyelid and in the medial cancer defects, if whether the lacrimal system is involved or not. So all these points should be well noted now. Uh, coming to the non-marginal eyelid defects, it's important that we uh, convert the defects to the leptical shape and the proper undermining of the adjoining tissue so that there is no tension while suturing. In case of upper lid, all incisions should be marked parallel to the eyelid margin and the closure should be done in a leptical fa uh, fashion so that uh, they, all the, uh, the scar lies in the relaxed skin tension line and the lower lid it should be perpendicular so that we prevent the ectropion. If the defect is large we may have to offer flaps or grafts uh, and uh, in case it's a full thickness defect close them in proper uh, multiple layers so that there is no ectropion or entropion. Coming to full thickness defects in the anterior lamellar uh, <laughs> defects uh, the healing by secondary indentation is not usually advocated in eyelid uh, healing. However, in medial canthal areas where the defect is smaller than one centimeter, so because of the concavity, they heal well, so we can leave them if this is only the anterior lamella involved. However, we can repair them by direct repair or can offer flaps or skin grafts if the uh, larger area is involved. This is a clinical example of a kissing nevus. The, after the excision, uh, the skin graft was used for reconstructing the anterior lamella. Uh, and the anterior lamella full thickness grafts, uh, the most sites commonly used are upper eyelid skin of the other eye and the post auricular. And the upper eyelid skin gives the best cos uh, cosmetic as in view of color and the texture match. So this is uh, the best, uh, should be the first choice if the, we have the extra skin of the other lid. Otherwise, we go for the post auricular. And the partial thickness graphs are used when we need a larger area. 
uh, and we have, as they have a greater viability, especially in the poorly vascularized blood, uh, such as in uh, burns and acid burns in patients. So coming to posterior lamellar defects, they can be, uh, we can reconstruct them using a tarso conjectural flap or the periosteal flaps are used when there is a uh, absent posterior lamella in the lateral portion of the lid. So we can, e the width of the uh, flap should be at least uh, one centimeter and should be designed such that uh, at an angle of 45 degrees so that we can mobilize it and uh, suture it with the remaining tarsus. The grafts which are used are tarsal conjugate graft, mucosa like heart palate and buccal mucosa and the cartilage, uh, nasal septal cartilage, auricular cartilage. These are mainly used for the lower lid reconstruction of the posterior lamellar defects. So tarsal conjunctiva is the best material for reconstructing the posterior lamella. The basic principles involve leaving the 4 millimeter of the uh, lid. Uh, this is just a small video showing the technique of tarso harvesting the tarsal conjunctiva flap. So you have to leave the 4 millimeter of the lid margin so that the integrity is maintained and, re and we preserve the vascular arcade. And the flap, the conjunctiva flap is uh, raised and is sutured to the remaining of the conjunctiva. In the upper lid, it is important that we uh, take, remove the, uh, dissect the levator as well as the molars. And, and after suturing the conjunctiva, it is important that we should anchor this uh, flap to the uh, canthus, medial or lateral, whichever you are reconstructing, so that we have good canthus formation at the end after the second stage. So just a clinical example showing the pre-operation and after the uh, uh, reconstruction of the both the lamella. So uh, when we have a full thickness defect, depending on the size, we have to offer different uh, methods which are available in the literature. So one should be well versed because we may, may have surprises on the table. So we, if what we have planned and after cutting the tumor, we may go for the, we have to repair the larger defect. Uh, this is the patient who had undergone a direct repair because of a small coloboma. It's a video showing a pentagon excision of the mass. And the basic principle is to uh, pa pass the suture uh, three millimeter from the cut origin just behind the gray line and then coming out of the other end and coming back and one millimeter from the cut margin and of the same depth and tightening the suture so that there is slight outpouching of the uh, lead margin so when it heals it flattens so the first suture is passed uh, it was a 6 or nylon suture just behind the gray line the other one at the posterior margin and the third one at the anterior lash margin the curtains are kept longer and are brought forward uh, so that they do not rub the ocular surface so once all the three sutures are passed we suture the tarsus with a uh, absorbable suture like 6O vicryl or 5O vicryl suture and then the skin is sutured. So the another patient, uh, the same patient who had the uh, rep uh, excision of the uh, this mass and there was pentagon excision and it was repaired. If the defects is less than two third of the lid, we can go for tensile semicircular flap which can use for reconstructing both the upper and the lower eyelid defects. So there is a conca and the basic is that the canthus should be spared and if there is a defect the canthus should be spared and the concavity can be uh, if there is upper defect the concavity has to be downward and the vice versa. So uh, coloma of the patient in the edges were uh, freshened up and then uh, the because of the upper lid was there so the concavity was marked so that from the canthus and uh, the should size should be about se 3 cm and should not go beyond the lateral orbital rim. Once the canthotomy is done, the superior cantholysis is required so that we mobilize the tissue well and the flap is raised uh, suborbicularis. And then the similar, uh, this thing is uh, marginal repair is carried out and then it's important that uh, after doing the repair of the margin and the tarsus, uh, we have to reformate the canthal area and if any dog here it's need to be cut so it's important that we reform the canthus we're using a, a mattress suture and uh, thus the effect created by the flap 
is need to be undermined so that we have a good closure and the suture is passed through uh, subcutaneous tissue and we take a deeper bite so there is no uh, hanging of the tissue later on. Uh, Tripier flap is also one of the technique where uh, the prerequisite that, that we should have a good uh, laxity of the skin can be used for upper lid or lower lid. This is the example of an uh, older patient who had a uh, lesion in the left <coughs> lower lid and then after the reconstruction of the posterior lamella with the tarsal conjecture of flap, the Tripier flap was harvested from the upper lid to reconstruct the lower lid the post-op picture. So in case there is a moderate to large defect, we can offer cotyledonous beer flaps and this may be used for almost half of the full thing, all the full, uh, full uh, lid defects. It's uh, full thickness advancement flaps uh, which is bridged from um, the lid upper to lower or lower to upper if it's an inverse cutler beer. So this is just a, a small video showing the inverse cutler beer reconstructing the <coughs> lower lid and lower eyelid we take a uh, full thickness advancement flap from the upper lid and after cutting the uh, tissue and after frozen section control we mark the lid 4 millimeters from the lid margin and the full thickness uh, cut was given by radio frequency and then the <coughs> anterior and the posterior lamella was uh, divided uh, separated and it was uh, this dissection is th should be done deep to the fornix so that we can mobilize the tissue and the two layers are se uh, sutured separately here we could mark supplies the remnant of the canalicula and then the conjunctiva was closed with the remaining conjunctiva and the, the skin was closed with the uh, lower lid So once the conjunctiva is closed, it's very important that we anchor this flap to the uh, can periosteum so that we have a good canthus later on after once we have done the second stage. So the bite is passed through the periorbital and the periosteum. The skin is closed. And after four and six weeks, the, the flap is divided <coughs> so that we can have a... Uh, uh, separation of the both the lamella is separated it's important that we have an extra conjunctiva when we are cutting the uh, this uh, in the second stage so this is was the one month post op in larger defects of the vertical if the lower eyelid we can go for mustardy cheek rotation flap this is the clinical example had a recurrence of the mevobian cell carcinoma so you can uh, make a good flap at, uh, as far as uh, ear and then mobilize all the tissues that the defect can be whole lower lid eyelid defect can be reconstructed. In case there is a uh, temporal defect, we can use the Frick flap, which is also uh, we, the ratio should be 4 is to 1, which we should keep in mind. And the, uh, for reconstructing the anterior lamella, however, we can reconstruct the posterior lamella using a tarsal conjectival flap. The other flaps which are superficial temporal artery based flaps which can be used. So all these flaps we should be aware of and should be well versed. So we have uh, basically we need to have the armenitarium uh, of uh, all these knowledge of all these uh, techniques so that whatever is best on the table we find we need to reconstruct, reconstruct these defects and uh, uh, these are the medial defects which need to be reconstructed. Uh, it's important because these are very uh, challenging because the lacrimal system is involved. So median forehead flap was used in this case. So basically the sound knowledge and different reconstructive techniques and we may have to mix and match all the flaps and grafts to reconstruct the eyelid to give the best cosmesis to the patient. Thank you. Next, I think lid reconstruction is a technique which has to be so many times decided on the table itself. I remember Dr. Kurana always used to tell me, pehle kaat lo, phir dimag lagao ki ab karna kya hai. Obviously, pre-op you have to be prepared one day before what you, but sometimes your decision changes on the table. So, uh, with experience you tend to learn. Uh, yeah, every time. So next we have a very prolific oculoplasty surgeon, Dr. Shreya Shah from Dahud, from uh, I think she's the director of Drishti Netrale and ma'am is going to speak on lid lacerations and canalicular injuries, tips and tricks in management. Dr. Shreya ma'am.
No, el plesio. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Urmil and my co-speakers, Dr. Bhavna, Dr. Shalu, uh, for allowing me to speak on. I, I'm not going to cover lead less lesson as most of the parties Dr. Shalu has covered. I'll just cover some of the techniques which we can use when we get the laceration of canaliculus. And uh, we know that damage to lacrimal drainage system can cause so many other distortions like telecanthus, globe displacement, epiphora. And there are lots and lots of ways of injury to canaliculus can be by direct laceration, stab wound, dog bite or uh, cattle care, in especially in our area. And there can be another uh, varieties of injury can be by indirect plant trauma, feast or airbag. Most of people, we as an oculoplastic surgeon know that consequences usually 10% suffer from constant or nearly constant epiphora. 40% have symptomatic epiphora with ocular irritation and 50% fairly asymptomatic in case of functioning canaliculus is not injured. So, uh, just rushing to uh, repair the canaliculus, you, you need to this keep this thing in, in the mind. Naturally, primary repair has got definitely higher success rate, but secondary repair also can be done. And when it should be done within 48 hours, for that you need to have controlled conditions for ocular ro uh, operation room, proper anesthesia, magnification, optimal illumination and endoscope. So, what are the step one, what we all know when you want to find out the canalicular laceration uh, is uh, a simple location of severed cut end so it is really very really difficult but then you have to locate the severe cut end the, the first thing is always inspect inspect and inspect whether you are able to see observe the flaringa's ring reflex it's much much better but we all are not lucky enough to get this flaringa's ring reflex every time you may support it with irrigating cannula fluorescein or bsss yellow viscoelastic or methylene blue but that also creates the mass so once you get the step one you uh, the step two is confirmation of the uh, procedure so whenever you are passing and you are uh, passing the probe with the red road technique you can confirm the thing and then third step always is a uh, stenting that is a, uh, you you mu need to put stand by canalicular or monocanalicular it's up to your choice and step four will be a pericanalicular suturing so we have lot many things available with us like mini monoca which is very very easily available people are using it very nicely and you can if but for that you have to know where the cut severe end is there you can just pass it into the flaringa's ring reflex the advantage of mono canalicular mini monocyze it has got reduced punctal injury or cheese wiring it is very very easily retract but it is very very costly so uh, all the tribal people everybody will not be able to afford all mini monoca which is costing quite high so cheapest option came which is easily available in operation room as a teflon sleeve of a intraket tube so we can use this teflon sleeve of intraket uh, once we find out the uh, proximal end of the canaliculus, we remove the piston and then we suture the pericanalicular tissue and we can retain this Teflon part of the intraket which is available with each OR. Uh, and you, you need to fix it uh, to uh, external surface in order to uh, get uh, rubbing of the cornea by Teflon sleeve. So, uh, it is very easily done in upper canaliculus also. You can do in upper canaliculus. Uh, it can be done with the secondary structure also. The advantage of Teflon sleeve is it is very, very cheap and it is available with each and every surgeon. 
but it creates local inflammation and uh, most of the time it is a non biological material it is in, in not invert material so usually it extrudes within 7 8 days so that you have to take care then we have an idea that we can use pigtail probe you can see the pigtail probe is a very gold standard but the probe itself is very thick it has got traumatic and and it has got eye so it is very very thick so sometime it may injure the in even non injured canaliculus and another disadvantage uh, what i said is pigtail is very very thick the most important part when you are dealing with the canalicular injury is finding out the severe cut end so one fine day this is the patient uh, which is a post operatively next day cataract surgery you can see still air bubble is there and hit by a uh, uh, road accident and that was a canalicular laceration i tried all a uh, whatever method I said we could not find so I just dilated the non injured end uh, of the punctum I took four oprolin suture I band the needle I cut the needle with uh, simple mosquito artery forceps this is the second surgery I kept the uh, etio emery stone but in first surgery I just rubbed it with my serrated end of the uh, artery forceps to make it blunt but this is the second surgery so I had my uh, embry stone available readily readily embry uh, available eto embryo stone so i just rubbed it i made the end blunt mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. i just dilated the non injured end of the canaliculus <coughs> now i'm holding the uh, needle uh, and it is a pigtail itself i'm holding with the cart needle holder here you have to see that you you cannot push let it go by itself you have to unlock the cart lock the cart you pull the lead margin so it goes in the right way and you can see it has come out through the other cut end where you don't have to search for the uh, cut end so it, and it is already proline so i took a chance to use the same material as a canaliculostomy also so i just passed the same suture into other end we tied the proline suture and now the canaliculostomy is ready with proline suture itself so uh, and now you can see there is there is a flaring gas ring reflex which is very easily available seen but it's not easy to see every time then i sutured the pericanaliculus tissue and then finally i just uh, cauterize the end of the proline suture so uh, it doesn't rub the cornea and i kept it for few uh, days and then later on i removed the canaliculus the same technique i used in pediatric patient also this is whole uh, literally version of lead i use here 6 o proline suture i made it blunt on table same technique i use i got the and very easily and then i sutured the pericanaliculus tissue and child was very doing very very nice post operatively anatomically and functionally so this is very cost effective easily available easy technique it's very less learning curve S surety of finding the uh, cut end of the canaliculus which we are not able to find and no other stent material is required they, they did same procedure in 10 more patient published the article also but then later on I came to know that this proline itself is a very strong suture and then not can irritate the cornea so that can be a corneal irritation so um, and it was not very very and what about the post traumatic strictures or hydrogenic strictures what we can create so we developed the stenetralia canaliculostomy silicon intubation set which has got the same needle now it's already readily available blunt and uh, same uh, curve with it is available in 21 22 and 23 gauge for the age uh, specification so here we are using the same technique but silicon material is readily available behind that so we can uh, just pass the same silicon su silicon tube and we can tie it later on and just we tie these two silicon tube and just pass the knot in the under the canaliculus it is uh, very very more advantage above said all the advantage of my uh, simple pigtail technique it could be used in evelsen lead also uh, sometime uh, when there is evelsen lead you have to support it with double arm 4 or such proline suture and this thing which was used in child also we use 24 gauge uh, here and uh, it is doing very well and then pr uh, provided by systemic antibiotics, steroid antibiotics four times a day, steroid combination and syringing. And you can do on table also, even post-operatively, you, you can do syringing 
just near the um, uh, stent and you can confirm it is patent then also came the my idea in mind it is little bit disadvantage is if not used skillfully it can create the false passage because you are pushing something it can create the false anastomosis cannot give confirmation of surety of the right passage when both the canaliculi are involved and after of course it can be used secondarily to create new passage when both the canaliculi are structured it can be used so because the complication we can deal with the newer technique is false anastomosis cheese wiring can happen which can happen with any kind of canalicular stomy ocular irritation or uh, sometime granuloma formation so now we are coming up with the de design with the olive same intubation silicon set with the olive tip so that can take care of the other false anastomosis part also so as i said primary repair is at most important and it is really a team approach have healthy recovery to all of your patient thanks to all my patients thanks to all my teachers and thank you for patient listening yeah i'm applying not to the silicon so now uh, we have three four techniques more also when you apply not to the silicon you have to slide that not into the uh, canaliculus itself and that should be then zero non absorbable suture now uh, your technique right now <coughs> is the same silicon i am putting the uh, with the same bhavna i am putting the silicon tube over that so later on that that suture also is available you just tie and just pass the silicon tube so silicon tube is outer cover and not uh, the uh, a non absorbable suture is inside the tube which you can tie and just slide you pull it back cut and let it go and the advantage of this is you can you, you can purchase one and use it in 10 more patients because let a part of the silicon only will be used you don't try mini manoka i know it's expensive but uh, routinely you don't try mini manoka and canalicular tear it is readily available this available, uh, <coughs> this technique is available with me and i have already this silicon incubation set so mm, because and that's what i'm saying that you can use it in 10 more patients <coughs> right thank you ma'am for the very nice talk and as you said inspection inspection and inspection is the most important thing and we also in medical college we try to tell our residents ki jo casualty mein jab aap pehli baar dekhte ho na us time jo aapne manipulation kar di that will decide the future of that canaliculate so you have to be very particular us time pe wo agar aap flaringa ring dekhne ki koshish karo and you try not to manipulate if you think it is not possible it is better to be shifted to the main ot than to just do it do the suturing just to for the sake of doing that is more harmful so residents should be instructed especially in government hospitals because they are the ones who are first of all facing those patients so with that uh, we come to our next talk and another young dynamic oculoplastic surgeon is with us dr bhavna khurana and she is going to speak on lid and lacrimal abscess navigating the changing tre trends in antibiotic sensitivity Thank you, Dr. Urmil. Uh, I'll be discussing our observations on uh, the changing trends in antibiotic sensitivity in uh, lid and lacrimal abscesses. Briefly about lacrimal abscess, uh, it starts mostly as an acute dacryocystitis, maybe secondary to NLD obstruction and secondary bacterial growth in the stagnant fluid. There can be a varied clinical spectrum ranging from mild tenderness erythema to a frank lacrimal abscess and untreated can have grave uh, consequences. Uh, lid abscesses and preseptal uh, cellulitis are infections that can originate from small lesions like Chalazia hordeola or from the adjacent sinuses or due to retained foreign body skin infections or maybe uh, trauma or post-surgical procedures. Uh, briefly discussing this case scenario, this was a one-month male child uh, who had uh, presented with the dacryocystocele uh, and had a lacrimal abscess. So, uh, because of the lacrimal abscess, the patient had to undergo uh, incision and drainage followed by uh, microscopic examination and culture sensitivity. Uh, when we saw the culture sensitivity report, we were very surprised to see that at this one month of age, the child was sensitive only to cefazolin, gentamicin and clindamycin and was resistant to most of the common antibiotics, broad spectrum antibiotics that we mostly use. And of course, since the child is only one month of age, there is no previous history of any antibiotic used in him. 
So this got us thinking and we did a short study on the microbiological profile of lid and lacrimal abscesses and to study the trend of antibiotic sensitivity. So this was a, a pilot project that I did during my fellowship. It was a prospective interventional analysis uh, from May 2014 to Jan 2015, where we studied the disease profile, the gram stain and the KOH mount, the culture organism that we got in the culture and the antibiotic sensitivity. So the standard protocol that was followed in the case of abscesses was incision and drainage, followed by um, gram stain and microscopic examination, culture, followed by antibiotic sensitivity. And after that, uh, we would routinely put the patient on a broad spectrum antibiotic. So uh, during this uh, duration of the study, we had 27 patients, equal uh, division of lacrimal and lid infections. Most were gram positive, 25% of them, and 75% uh, of them, and 25% were gram negative. Culture positivity was found in 20 of out of the 27 patients. Uh, about the lacrimal abscesses, most of them uh, turned out to be gram negative. Common ones were Haemophilus, E. coli, Pseudomonas, and Proteus. Uh, the antibiotic sensitivity profile in the lacrimal abscesses were that all of them were found to be sensitive to cefazoline and amikacin. 60% uh, were resistant to amoxicillin clavulanic acid and 55% to moxifloxacin. We compared this with a study that had been done earlier studying the microbiology of the abscesses and their culture sensitivity. Uh, so the gram positive and gram negative distribution, what we got was slightly different from the earlier study. Also, they found that uh, most of the uh, uh, cultures were sensitive to amoxiclavulinate, the gram positive ones and the gram negative ones to quinolones, whereas most of our cases were resistant to amoxiclavulinate and also to the quinolones. Coming to lid abscesses, um, seven out of the eight were positive in culture and most were staph aureus. And coming to the sensitivity, all of them were sensitive to cefazoline and gentamicin. And resistance, uh, cipro and moxifloxacin resistance was in 50% and amoxiclavulinic acid in almost 85%. So uh, the most common organism in the study done earlier and in our study was the same Staphylococcus aureus. Uh, whereas in the earlier study, most were sensitive to amoxicillin clavulinic acid, but in our study, most were 85% were found to be resistant to amoxicillin clavulinate. So after the initial pilot study, we continued the prospective interventional study over five years, collated cases uh, done at four uh, centers over the five year period. Uh, we got 60 cases, lacrimal and lid abscess uh, division was approximately equal. Gram staining profile, 78% for gram positive. Culture positivity was found in 73%. Most of the lacrimal abscesses were found, 50% uh, of the lacrimal abscesses were found to be resistant to amoxicillin clavulinic acid. Resistance to moxifloxacin in 50%. In lid abscess, the most common organism was Staph aureus still. Resistance to amoxclavulinate in 65%, resistance to ciprofloxacin in 40%, and to moxifloxacin in 50%. So this brings us to the question that after doing an IND and sending for a culture sensitivity, what would be the most recommended broad-spectrum antibiotic that we can start on the patient till we come up with a sensitivity report? So this is just to highlight the emerging antimicrobial resistance, which has been identified as one of the top global public health threats by WHO, the main cause being misuse and overuse of antibiotics, leading to an exponentially rising level of resistance, also has significant economic costs along with increased disability and death in our uh, patients. The patients that we get, it could lead to uh, things as grave as orbital cellulitis, superior ophthalmic vein thrombosis and cavernous sinus thrombosis, to name a few conditions. So this calls out for a careful and judicious use of the antibiotics that we have in hand. Thank you for patient listening. Recognized in 500 BC by Hippocrates, 
description of modern nf was made by joseph jones who was a military surgeon of the army and he uh, reported 2642 cases of gas gangrene treated in hospital during the american civil war with a mortality rate of approximately 46% later in 1883 jean alfred fournier described nf in perineal region also which was called as fournier's gangrene it is basically of two types type 1 which is more common generally polymicrobial it is a mixture of aerobic and anaerobic organisms while type 2 is the monomicrobial one often with a history of trivial trauma when streptopyogenes and aureus usual pathogens and it may be associated with toxic shock syndrome it can be extensive to the extent that acute inflammatory reaction involving the subcutaneous fat and deep penetration into the muscles and deeper tissues can be done and uh, that uh, and it can be needing a little more examination when we find extensive suppuration and tissue necrosis and overwhelming bacterial colonization can be seen associated with intravascular thrombosis and invasion of vessel walls by microorganisms clinical classification can be fulminant acute or subacute fulminant is a, with a very rapid onset and progression severe cases can result in circulatory shock and multi organ failure also it can be acute when it involves large areas of skin and progresses over a few time period of few days and subacute when it is insidious going on for of several weeks and involving a localizing area early clinical features can be disproportionate pain in the area of injury flu like symptoms patient may feel dehydrated while late features can be swelling in that area appearance of blisters and necrotic appearance with bluish white or dark mottled appearance critical symptoms when the patient needs icu care can be when there is a sudden drop in blood pressure septic shock or loss of consciousness in ophthalmology it rarely involves the periocular skin less than 60 well documented case reports over the last 50 years occlusion of central retinal artery and loss of vision have been reported and high mortality has also been seen ranging from 6 to 76% how to proceed with the management immediate surgical debridement of the involved tissue incisions may be extended beyond visibly involved tissue appropriate antibiotics need to be given and do not wait for imaging studies if you suspect necrotizing fasciitis we have to be careful in doing the various ex ocular examination the visual acuity pupillary reaction color vision visual field ocular movements iop slit lamp dilated fundus examination document the proptosis retropulsion test should be tried and wherever needed imaging should be done it can also be scored uh, with the help of uh, these uh, 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 lrenac scoring it is called where we do the wbc count crp hemoglobin level serum sodium serum creatinine and blood glucose level and they are summed up and a total score of more than 6 is highly suggestive of necrotizing fasciitis surgical management is early reconstruction of the affected area after complete control of infection and late correction of the cicatricial ectropion and other ocular surface abnormalities wherever needed there are no definitive guidelines which you may follow uh, demarcating the recovery is the early phase when there is uh, when you when you keep debriding and you see mark it is marked by clearance of the infection and development of healthy granulation tissue and in the late phase scar formation and contracture sets in with the subsequent sequelae of ectropion and trichiasis early reconstruction is done immediately after control of infection within 2 weeks of commencement of treatment and implies it is done mainly so that sequelae can be prevented and generally skin skin grafting is done a late reconstruction sometimes a patient reports after the sequelae have developed or the sequelae are allowed to develop and correction is done with the various other means of corrections of late reconstruction so this was case, uh, case first case tense edema of upper eyelid on day 1 necrosis was seen in the upper eyelid visual acuity pupillary and all these things were normal preseptal cellulitis was diagnosed on the basis of ct and iv antibiotics were started slowly necrosis set in and debridement was planned extensive necrosis of subcutaneous tissue set in diagnosis was revised as necrotizing fasciitis now and thorough debridement then with iv antibiotics in the first case after removal of an, an, an necrotic tissue the uh, was all removed and healthy granulation tissue started growing after thorough debridement of wound uh, uh, preparation of the recipient bed for surgery and uh, when once the necrotic tissue has been removed only pink healthy granulation tissue is left and uh, stay sutures are applied lid is pulled downwards to expose the complete size of recipient size you have to be careful to over correct to prevent the contracture to develop 360 degree undermining of skin is done and measurement of recipient area is taken to determine the size of defect 
from the supraclavicular region you can take the graft which is 30 percent larger than the recipient area and lifting up a full thickness free skin graft then the clearing of the under surface of the graft is done as we do it routinely and graft is sutured with six zero sutures lid crease forming sutures wherever needed can be applied stab wounds in the end and a bolster is applied post operative in the early post op period marked can be marked with flaring of infection IV and type antibiotics are the main uh, first line treatment. Sutures can be removed after 15 days and in the late post op period once if you think uh, scar has developed later on once everything is resolved scar modulation with 5 FU and can be done with uh, at fortnightly interval 3 injections and later on uh, we can give the uh, this uh, skin grafting. So 3 months post op picture of this patient showing excellent cosmetic result when no lag of thalmos or cicatricial ectropion was there. This was another case in an 18 months old child who presented with history of fall from bed, bluish discoloration of upper lid skin was developed. After 4 days the child developed extreme irritability, fever and necrosis and uh, it was started on IV antibiotics, debridement of the necrotic tissue was done and debride tissue was sent for histopathology and repeat debridement was done every 2 days. And management of the recipient site similarly was done after with the skin grafting. Uh, with donor site was taken from the retro auricular area, post operative appearance of this child. This was another 65 years old diabetic female who presented this way. The whole area had to be debrided. Uh, and later on, this is another case again with the black ishar formation that can set in in such cases and you have to be as i said very patient with dealing of this patient you may sometimes take one to two weeks till healthy granulation tissue develops and you have to do keep doing repeated debridements so the take home message is that necrotizing fasciitis is a potentially blinding and life threatening disorder it needs early diagnosis and prompt management Ocular involvement calls for early reconstruction of the involved area and scar modulation in late post-operative period can act as an adjunct for better results. Thank you so much. I thank everyone who is sitting here and with that we can come to the end of our instruction course and I request all of you we can have a group photograph. And first let us have our photograph speakers. Then we Thank <laughs> you.